a very good evening as friends i welcome you all back to the hindu daily news analysis of shankar s academy today i am going to cover important news articles from the hindu newspaper dated 16th of may 2023 and displayed here are the list of news articles that we will be discussing today you can go through it and a kind request to you all those who haven't yet subscribed our youtube channel do subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our future current affairs videos now let's get into our first news article discussion now look at this editorial here the author of this editorial is concerned about a recent interim order of the supreme court related to default bail now in this discussion we will focus on three things firstly we will understand what is default bail then secondly we will see the background of this supreme court's interim order and finally we will see what will be the implications of this supreme court's order okay now straight away let's get into the discussion before that make a note of the syllabus relevant to this topic now first let's understand what is default bail see default bail is also known as statutory bail basically it is a right to bail and it arises when the police fail to complete their investigation within a specified period for a person in judicial custody note that this right is enshrined in section 167 class 2 of the code of criminal procedure that is crpc according to this section when the police are not able to finish the investigation within 24 hours they present the suspect before a magistrate the magistrate will then decide whether the suspect should be held in police custody or judicial custody now what is police custody and what is judicial custody see the difference is mainly based on the time period when it comes to police custody the magistrate can order the accused person to be detained for up to 15 days and if more time is needed to complete the investigation the accused can be held in judicial custody now you may ask what happens if the investigation cannot be completed within the specified period see in this case the accused person has the right to seek bail this is what we call the default bail know that the accused cannot be held for more than 90 days if the investigating authority is looking into certain crimes like crime punishable by death life imprisonment or imprisonment for at least 10 years for other offenses the maximum period of detention is 60 days here it is important to note that there are some special cases where the time period for investigation may be different for example under the narcotic drugs and psychotropic substances act the investigation period can be up to 180 days so these provisions demonstrate that the extension of time for investigation is not automatic but requires a judicial order i hope this clarifies the concept of default bail for you now with this understanding we will see what is the background based on which the article is written see the supreme court of india made an order on may 1st this order has caused concern among legal professionals but why this is what we are going to understand now see this interim order basically sought to recall the court's own decision in a case called ritu chabaria versus union of india case in the ritu chabaria judgment the supreme court held that the right of default bail is not merely a statutory right but a fundamental right that flows from article 21 of the constitution and this was to protect the accused persons from the unfettered and arbitrary power of the state so this means that the supreme court has previously recognized the right to default bail as an indefeasible right flowing from article 21 of the indian constitution we all know article 21 guarantees the right to life and personal liberty not just in ritu chabaria case but in other case also supreme court has asserted the same for example in the case of achpal versus state of rajasthan 2018 case the court held that no court has the power to extend the period of investigation in terms of section 167 of crpc similarly in yaskasi versus state 2020 case the court emphasized that even during the covid-19 pandemic investigating agencies cannot get any relaxation in computing the maximum stipulated period of investigation it seems fair right but what's the problem here see the protection under section 167 class 2 has been actually weakened in practice this is because the investigating authorities often file incomplete or supplementary charge sheets within the 60 or 90 day period they do this to prevent the accused from seeking default bail also in some cases charge sheets are filed after the time limit but before the accused can apply for default bail 
I mean, if the investigation time is already over and the accused is going to seek default bail day after tomorrow, police will somehow manage to submit the charge sheet tomorrow. So now since the charge sheet is submitted, the accused cannot seek default bail. So these were some discrepancies that are happening in practice. Now for those who don't know what a charge sheet is, just know that a charge sheet is the final report prepared by a police officer or investigative agency after completing their investigation of a case. Okay. Now coming back to the case, see in Ritu Chabaria judgment, the court invalidated these illegal practices that I mentioned before. And it also clarified that incomplete charge sheets cannot stop the accused from seeking default bail. This means that if the charge sheet is incomplete, the accused can still seek default bail. The court emphasized that the preliminary or incomplete nature of the police reports indicates that the investigation is not complete. See here it is important to note that the Ritu Chabaria judgment did not introduce any new hurdles in the investigation process. Instead, it just stressed upon the prior judgments. We know that many previous judgments established constitutional basis of the right to default bail. Therefore, the author of the editorial says that the Ritu Chabaria judgment simply reiterated that incomplete charge sheets cannot prevent the accused from seeking release on default bail. However, in the recent order, the Supreme Court is considering to recall the Ritu Chabaria judgment. This raises concerns because this will have far more implications. Now we will see what will be the implications if the court recalls the Ritu Chabaria judgment. The author says that if the judgment is recalled, it might imply that the right to default bail which is derived from the Indian constitution is inferior to the difficulties faced by investigative authorities. See just because the investigative agencies are not able to do their job on time, an accused cannot remain in jail for a prolonged time right. Adding to this, the Supreme Court did another thing. The Supreme Court has suspended decisions on default bails across the country, which were supposed to be decided according to the Ritu Chabaria judgment. So as of now, other courts cannot make decisions on default bail based on Ritu Chabaria judgment. So this will affect the constitutional rights of the accused person. So these are the implications of the interim order. Okay. Now that's all regarding this discussion. This discussion we saw about what is default bail. Then we saw about the background of Supreme Court's order on default bail. And finally we saw some points about the implications of Supreme Court's order. See this topic is very much important for your mains exam. So make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now with these points let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this article here. According to the article, Health Ministry has directed the union government doctors to prescribe only generic medicines. It also added that visits of medical representatives to hospitals should be curtailed completely. This is about the news article given here. Now in this context, first we will understand about generic medicines. See a generic drug is a medication created to be similar to an already marketed brand name drug. It will be similar in dosage form, safety and strength, route of administration, quality, performance characteristics and intended use. See generic medicines are used because they do not cost much like their branded counterpart. This means they are cheap. So generic medicines will help the people in significantly reducing their medication bills. Okay. Now when we talk about generic medicines, you should know about this scheme known as PMBJP. It is expanded as Pradhan Mantri Bharatiya Jan Aushadi Pariyojana. The main aim of the scheme is to provide quality medicines at affordable prices to the masses. Under the scheme, PM BJP stores are set up to provide generic drugs. They will be available at lower prices. Additionally, they will be equivalent in quality and efficacy as the expensive branded drugs. Know that Pradhan Mantri Bharatiya Jan Aushadi Pariyojana was launched by the Department of Pharmaceuticals in November 2008 under the name Jan Aushadi Campaign. Know that the stores that are set up under the scheme are called Jan Aushadi Kendras. These stores are only open to provide generic medicines at affordable prices. Know that as of now in India there are 9082 Jan Aushadi Kendras. The product basket under the PMBJB scheme includes 1759 drugs and 208 surgical items. See the prices of these products are 50 to 90 percentage lesser than that of branded medicine prices in open market. And also note that the medicines in these stores are procured only from WHO GMP that is WHO Good Manufacturing Products Certified Suppliers. 
and this is to ensure the quality of products okay and that's all regarding this discussion In this discussion we saw about what are generic medicines then we saw about the pradhan mantri bharatiya jan aushadi pariyojana scheme and finally we saw some points about jan aushadi kendras see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next article now look at this article from the text and context page this article is about the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act 2013 this act is shortly called as posh act 2013 it has been in news because recently the supreme court has expressed its view about the issues in the implementation of this posh act 2013 so this is the background now in this backdrop let us learn about posh act 2013 Now firstly we look at how this Posh Act came into force. See around 1980s and 1990s the child marriage at very young ages very much prevalent in Rajasthan. In the year 1992 Banwari Devi who was a social worker in Rajasthan government's women development project was sexually assaulted by five men. This was after she tried to stop the marriage of one year old girl. Yes you heard me right. It was a one year old child. See the Rajasthan High Court convicted those five men with a punishment that was very much lesser than the crime of rape. After that a group of non-profit organizations who worked for safety of women filed a PAL in Supreme Court seeking justice for Banwari Devi and also appropriate punishment for the men involved in gang rape. And this case is famously known as the Vishaka case. The NGOs mentioned that Banwari Devi was raped due to the work she was supposed to perform as part of her employment. So the PAL sought to develop a new set of guidelines for the safety of women at workplaces. As a result, the Supreme Court brought out the Vishaka guidelines for protection of women at workplaces. These guidelines were instituted by the Supreme Court in the year 1997. The Supreme Court prescribed to follow the Vishaka guidelines until a new law has been enacted in this regard. Subsequently in 2007 protection of women against sexual harassment and workplace bill was introduced in the parliament it went through many amendments and its final version came into force on December 9 2013 as the sexual harassment of women at workplace prevention prohibition and redressal act 2013 which is called as posh act 2013 okay this is about the background of creation of posh act now we will move on to see about the definition of the term sexual harassment the posh act 2013 defines sexual harassment in a broader sense it includes unwelcoming acts such as physical contact and sexual advances a demand or request for sexual favors making sexually colored remarks showing pornography and any other unwelcome physical verbal or non verbal conduct of a sexual nature okay this is about the definition of sexual harassment provided in posh act 2013 apart from this the act term employee of a company apart from this the act also defines the employee of a company as per posh act 2013 the term employee of a company includes all women employees who are employed regularly temporarily contractually or on daily wage basis it even includes the interns and apprentices in the company okay this is about the definition of employee provided under posh act 2013 Now moving on to see about the mandates need to be followed by an employer. See the Posh Act 2013 mandates an employer with more than 10 employees to form an internal complaints committee. This committee will be approached by the aggrieved woman in case of sexual harassment. Now coming to its composition, the internal complaints committee has to be headed by a woman and it should have at least two women employees. Apart from this, a third party such as a NGO worker with at least five years experience and who is familiar with the challenges of sexual harassment should also included in internal complaints committee apart from this the posh act 2013 also mandates all the districts in india to create a local committee to receive complaints from women working in firms with less than 10 employees and from the informal sector including domestic workers home based workers voluntary government social workers and so on and at the end of every year the employer has to file an annual audit report to the district officer about the number of harassment cases filed and the measures taken okay this is the mandates that has to be followed by an employer 
See, in the beginning of this discussion, I have said that Supreme Court has expressed its view regarding the issues in the implementation of Posh Act 2013 right. Now, let us see what are those issues. See, the Supreme Court in its recent observation mentioned that the internal complaints committee are not properly established in many workplaces as per the Posh Act 2013. A newspaper report was cited by the Supreme Court that says that 16 out of the 30 national sports federation had not even constituted an internal complaints committee till now. Then the another main issue in this regard is that the improper constitution of an internal complaints committee. See most of the internal complaints committees had an inadequate number of members or they are lacking a mandatory external member. Okay, this is one issue. Then some of the other issues include there is no clear mention in POSH Act about accountability that is who ensures the complaints of workplaces and who will be held liable if the provisions of this act are not followed. Apart from this, the POSH Act is largely inaccessible to women working in the informal sector. See, many of the sexual harassment cases at workplace are hugely underreported. This is because of various reasons like exhaustive process in legal system, power dynamics of organizations and fear of professional repercussions. Okay, this is about the issues with POSH Act 2013. See the inefficient functioning of judicial system and the lack of clarity in law about how to conduct such inquiries are some of the issues associated with POSH Act. Okay, so Supreme Court directed the states and union territories to conduct a time bound exercise to verify whether the organizations under the government have established the internal complaint committees, local committees and internal committees under the POSH Act 2013. Apart from this, Supreme Court has also ordered these bodies to publish the details about their committees in their websites. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about the background for creation of POSH Act 2013. Then we saw about the definition of sexual harassment and employee provided in the POSH Act 2013. Then we saw about the issues with the POSH Act 2013. And finally, we saw some points about the Supreme Court's recent observation about POSH Act 2013. See, this topic is very much important for your mains exam. So, make note of each and every points that we discussed. Now, with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, look at this article here. It reports that the National Institute of Epidemiology will train Ayush researchers in the fundamentals of basic research under the Union Government's Integrative Healthcare Initiative. Know that the National Institute of Epidemiology is a premier institute of the Indian Council for Medical Research. So, in this discussion, we will learn about Indian Council for Medical Research that is the ICMR from prelims perspective. See, the ICMR is an apex body in India that focuses on the formulation, coordination and promotion of biomedical research. Know that ICMR is one of the oldest medical research organizations in the world. It was established in 1911 as the Indian Research Fund Association. The main objective of the Indian Research Fund Association was to sponsor and coordinate medical research in the country. Then after India gained independence, the Indian Research Fund Association was renamed as the Indian Council of Medical Research in 1949. Now coming to the objective of ICMR, the ICMR plays a vital role in conducting, coordinating and implementing medical research for the benefit of society. It basically aims to translate medical innovations into practical products and processes so that they can be introduced into the public health system. So we can say that ICMR strives to bridge the gap between research and practical implementation for the betterment of public health. And know that the ICMR is funded by the government of India and it operates under the Department of Health Services in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. Here you should know that ICMR is neither a statutory body nor a regulatory body. Whereas it is an apex body that focuses on formulation, coordination and promotion of biomedical research in India. And know that ICMR hosts the Clinical Trials Registry India that is CTRI. So what is this CTRI? See CTRI is an online system where clinical trials conducted in India are registered and publicly recorded. See before June 15, 2009 trial registration at CTRI was voluntary. However after June 15, 2009 the Drug Controller General of India made it mandatory for clinical trials to be registered at CTRI, that is Clinical Trials Registry India. Okay, now talking about the organizational structure of ICMR, see ICMR includes a governing body presided over by the Union Health Minister. Then to assist with scientific and technical matters, there is a scientific advisory board. 
This scientific advisory board consists of renowned experts in various biomedical disciplines. Currently, the ICMR conducts research through its 32 permanent research institutes or centers. These are national institutes located in different parts of India. These institutes focus on specific areas of research and contribute to the advancement of medical knowledge and healthcare practices. I hope this provides you with a clear understanding of the Indian Council for Medical Research and its important role in medical research in India. Okay, that's all regarding this discussion. Now with these key points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this text and context article. This article talks about Aadhaar enabled payment system which is shortly called as AEPS. This is in news because of a recent tweet posted by a popular YouTuber. The YouTuber shared how his mother's account was drained using an Aadhaar linked fingerprint without needing a two-factor authentication. And his mother was not informed of the transactions by her bank through message or otherwise. Subsequently, through investigation it was found that the cyber criminals are now using silicon thumbs to operate biometric POS device or biometric ATMs to drain users' bank accounts. So what is this other enabled payment system and how they work? Now we will see about them in detail. Now before getting into discussion, the syllabus relevant to this topic is given here. You can go through it. Now first let's take other enabled payment system. As the name implies, other enabled payment system is a payment service which empowers a bank customer to use Aadhaar as his or her identity to access his or her respective Aadhaar enabled bank account and to perform basic banking transactions like balance enquiry, cash deposit, cash withdrawal and remittances through a business correspondent. See this Aadhaar enabled payment system initiative was started by joint efforts of Reserve Bank of India and Indian Banks Association and later it was developed by National Payments Corporation of India. Here if you could not understand what is happening, let me explain how it works. Then you will understand. See the other enabled payment system leverages other online authentication and enables other enabled bank accounts to be operated in any time anywhere through micro ATMs. Here a micro ATM is a biometric authentication enabled handheld device which is also known as a point of transaction or POT terminal machine which serves as the doorstep banking system. See micro ATMs can perform all types of transactions including deposits and customer to customer transfers. Now look at this image here. This is how micro ATM looks like. See to get benefit out of other enabled payment system, the beneficiary bearing a UID number that is the other number should approach a business correspondent with the request to withdraw cash. Here a business correspondent is an approved bank agent providing basic banking service using a micro ATM. As per the request of the customer, the business correspondent feeds beneficiaries UID number, fingerprints and amount into the micro ATM. The other server authenticates the beneficiary's ID and get his bank account using the ID mapper. Once this mapping is successful, the debit and credit transactions are carried out and then a message is sent to the beneficiary and the beneficiary gets his cash. To put it simply, the Aadhaar enabled payment system removes the need for OTPs, bank accounts and other financial details. It allows fund transfers using only the bank name, Aadhaar number and fingerprint captured during Aadhaar enrollment. Remember there are two forms of payment services carried out under Aadhaar enabled payment system. The first facilitates crediting money into the beneficiary accounts whereas the second enables account holders to withdraw their cash. Now even this kind of payment system has many advantages like bank decongestion, increasing social security benefits, last mile service enablement and so on. It also has its own disadvantages like fraudulent business correspondent, then no accounting of fraudulent transactions and so on. Now what is shocking is cyber criminals have now begun to use silicone thumbs to operate biometric POS device and biometric ATMs to drain users bank accounts. Here you might have a doubt. From where do the cyber criminals get all the authenticated biometric information that is available only with the government? See this doubt is prevalent with the government also. The UIDA that is the government agency which is managing Aadhaar has denied any breach of data and said that the Aadhaar data including biometric information is fully safe and secure. However, UIDAI's database is not the only source from where data can be leaked. 
ஆதார் நம்பர்ஸ் ஆர் ரெடிலி அவைலபிள் இந்த ஃபார்ம் ஆஃப் ஃபோட்டோ காப்பீஸ் அண்ட் சாஃப்ட் காப்பீஸ் அந்த கிரிமினல்ஸ் ஆர் யூசிங் ஆதார் என்னபிள்ட் பேமெண்ட் சிஸ்டம்ஸ் டு பிரீச் யூசர் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் தென் த ஸ்கேமர்ஸ் மேக் யூஸ் ஆஃப் சிலிகோன் டு ட்ரிக் டிவைசஸ் இன் டு இனிஷியேட்டிங் ட்ரான்சாக்ஷன்ஸ் ஸோ ஹியர் கம்ஸ் த கொஷின் ஹவு டு செக்யூர் யுவர் ஆதார் பயோமெட்ரிக் இன்ஃபர்மேஷன் For this, the UIDA is proposing an amendment to the Aadhaar Sharing of Information Regulations 2006. This will require entities in possession of an Aadhaar number to not share details unless the Aadhaar numbers have been redacted or blacked out through appropriate means both in print and electronic form. Apart from this, the UIDA has also implemented a new two-factor authentication mechanism that uses a machine learning based security system. The mechanism combines fingerprint detail and finger image capture to check the liveness of your fingerprint additionally users are also advised to ensure that they lock their aadhar information by visiting the uida website or using the mobile app this will ensure that their biometric information even if compromised cannot be used to initiate financial transactions and it can be unlocked when the need for biometric authentication arises like for property registration and passport renewals and after that it can be again locked so if you ask what can be done in case of a financial scam using aadhar for this the users who have not already locked their aadhar biometric information are advised to lock it immediately in case of any suspicious activity in their bank accounts and according to the rbi a customer has the right to zero liability if an unauthorized transaction occurs and the customer notifies the bank within 3 working days of getting a message from the bank account about the transaction so users are also advised to inform their banks and the concerned authorities as soon as possible the timely reporting can ensure that any money transferred using fraudulent means is returned to the victim okay and that's all regarding this discussion this discussion we saw about what is aadhar enabled payment system then we saw about the issues associated with such payment system and finally we saw some points about how to secure your aadhar biometric information now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion Now look at this article here it says that in a two day convention in Delhi tribal delegates condemned states and center regarding the failure to implement the forest rights act 2006 this is about the news article given here now in this context let us see about the important provisions of forest rights act 2006 see the forest rights act 2006 is also known as scheduled tribes and other traditional forest dwellers Recognition of Forest Rights Act 2006 This act recognizes the right of the forest dwelling communities and other traditional forest dwellers by ensuring their rights on forest resources Now what are all the rights recognized under Forest Rights Act 2006 See there are many rights Now we will see them one by one Firstly the Forest Rights Act 2006 recognizes the right to hold and live in the forest land for habitation or for self cultivation secondly the act recognizes community rights such as nistar and thirdly the act ensures the right of ownership then access to collect use and dispose of minor forest produce and fourthly the forest rights act 2006 recognizes other community rights of users or entitlements such as fish and other products of water bodies grazing etc and fifthly the act recognizes the rights including community tenures of habitat for primitive tribal groups and pre agricultural communities and sixthly the act ensures the right for conversion of pattas or leases or grants issued by any local authority or any state government and seventhly the act ensures the right of settlement and conversion of all forest villages old habitation unserved villages into revenue villages and eighthly the act recognizes the right to protect regenerate or conserve or manage any community forest resource for sustainable use and finally the forest rights act 2006 recognizes the right of access to biodiversity and community right to intellectual property and traditional knowledge related to biodiversity and cultural diversity see these are some of the rights provided for forest dwellers under the forest rights act 2006 also know that gram sabha is the authority that initiates the process for determining the nature and extent of individual or community forest rights after determining gram sabha will pass a resolution to give effect if an person is aggrieved by the resolution of the gram sabha 
then they may give your petition to the sub divisional level committee within 60 days after that the sub divisional level committee will consider the petition and dispose it okay and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the rights recognized by fast rights act 2006 see upsc has already asked many questions about this fast rights act 2006 so make note of the rights that are recognized by fast rights act 2006 this will be very helpful for our upcoming prelims now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion now look at this article here this article is about arab league this is a news because of the readmission of syria into the arab league organization now in this regard we will understand about arab league and about why syria was suspended from the arab league now first let's take arab league see the arab league is formally known as the league of arab of states it was established in cairo on 22nd march 1945 following the adoption of the alexandria protocol in 1944 the objective of the arab league is to strengthen and coordinate the political cultural economic and social programs of its members and to mediate disputes among them or between them and third parties see the arab league makes decisions on a majority basis but there is no mechanism to compel members to comply with resolutions so we can say that the resolutions taken by arab league are not obligatory now moving on to see about the membership of arab league initially there were only 6 members which include egypt iraq jordan lebanon saudi arabia and syria but currently the arab league consists of 22 member nations those 22 member nations are displayed in this image you can pause the video and go through it now with this understanding let us discuss about syria and arab league see the syria was expelled from arab league in 2011 this was because the syrian president bashar al assad brutally suppressed pro democracy protests which ultimately ended in a civil war as a result of this civil war half a million of people were killed and 23 million people were displaced and this is why the syria was suspended from the arab league now moving on to see about the syria's official return to arab league after a decade the arab league's decision to reinstate syria's membership is seen as a result of the diplomatic efforts by syria which gained momentum after the massive earthquake that affected turkey and syria recently on 7th may the arab league voted to reinstate syria's membership the decision was taken at a closed door meeting attended by foreign ministers from 13 out of 22 member states held in cairo egypt so this ruling will allow bashar al assad to attend the upcoming arab summit in saudi arabia on 19th of may okay now we will look about the arab league's stand on syrian crisis arab league secretary general ahmed abul hayt said that Syria's readmission does not mean that the Syria crisis has been solved but it allows the Arab states to communicate with Syrian government regarding the ongoing crisis also a committee was formed by the Arab League with Egypt Saudi Arabia Lebanon Jordan and Iraq to resolve the civil war as resulting refugee and drug smuggling cases okay and that's all regarding this discussion is the discussion we saw about Arab League then about the objective of Arab League then we saw about the membership of Arab League and finally we saw some points about the relations between syria and arab league see this topic is very much important for your prelims exam so make note of each and every points that we discussed now let's move on to the next news article discussion now let's take up this final article for our discussion this article is about idex it is a flagship initiative of the ministry of defense the article said that the idex has reached a milestone which is the signing of the 250th contract this is about the article given here now using this as an opportunity we will learn about idex first of all know that idex is expanded as innovations for defense excellence as we all know small enterprises startups and innovators have the competence flexibility and adaptability to supply the indian military with innovative and ingenious technological solutions but a special effort is required to engage these enterprises with the indian military so one such effort is idex IDEX was formulated and approved by the Ministry of Defence. IDEX was formally launched during Def Expo 2018 by the Honorable Prime Minister. In order to implement the IDEX framework, Defence Innovation Organisation was set up by the government. I know that the IDEX will be implemented for the next 5 years. That is from 2021 to 22 to 2025 to 26. 
and the main purpose of the idex framework is to provide financial support to nearly 300 startups or msmes or individual investors and about 20 partner incubators now talking about the objectives of idex the core objectives of the idex include firstly the idex facilitate rapid development of new indigenous and innovative technologies for the indian defense and aerospace sector and also to meet the needs for defense sectors in shorter timelines secondly the idex initiative aims to create a culture of engagement with innovative startups and to encourage co-creation for defense and aerospace thirdly the idex initiative aims to empower a culture of technology co-creation and co-innovation with the defense and aerospace sectors finally the idex initiative aims to boost innovation among the startups and encourage them to be a part of indian defense and aerospace ecosystems so basically the scheme aspires to achieve self reliance and indigenization in defense and aerospace sector this in turn will bolster the atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan dream of the government also it will help in reducing the import bill we all know india imports majority of its defense equipments from foreign countries so this initiative will help in reducing the import bills and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw about the idex initiative and we saw about the objectives of idex initiative now with these key points in mind let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion that is to discuss preliminary practice questions now look at this first question here this question is about pradhan mantri bharatiya jan aushadi pariyojana now let's take the first statement the scheme is implemented by a society registered under the society registration act see this statement is correct the scheme was launched by department of pharmaceuticals but it is implemented by a society registered under the society registration act it is the pharma and medical bureau of india it was previously known as bureau of pharma and know that it is one of the psus of india so statement one is correct now coming to the second statement jan aushadi kendras opened under the scheme are stores that ensure the availability of cost effective generic medicines to all its citizens see this statement is correct the main objective of opening jan aushadi kendras is to ensure the availability of cost effective generic medicines so statement 2 is also correct here the question is asking for correct statements so the correct answer is option c both 1 and 2 now let's move on to the second question now look at this question here this question is about indian council of medical research now look at the first statement icmr doesn't have the power to directly initiate punitive action against doctors see this statement is correct we saw that icmr is neither a statutory body nor a regulatory body according to the clinical trial rules only the dcga that is drugs control general of india can initiate action when investigators fail to comply with drugs and cosmetics act or the rules also if the doctors at the trial sites do not adhere to icmr's research guidelines they will be guilty of professional misconduct under the indian medical council regulations 2002 in such cases the power to punish lies with the state medical council so statement one is correct icmr doesn't have the power to directly initiate punitive action against doctors and it lies with state medical council so statement one is correct now come to the second statement every clinical trial in india must have permission from the icmr and strictly follow the approved protocols see this statement is incorrect under rule 80 class 2 of the new drugs and clinical trial rules 2019 clinical trials have to be undertaken before manufacturing any investigational new drug including vaccines under this every clinical trial must have permission from dcgi and strictly follow the approved protocols so statement 2 is incorrect because every clinical trial in india must have permission from dcgi and not from icmr so statement 2 is incorrect if the question is asking for correct statements so the correct answer for the question is option a one only now let's move on to the third question This question is about Defence Innovation Organisation. Now look at the first statement. Defence Innovation Organisation is a not-for-profit company as per Section 8 of the Companies Act 2013. See, this statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion, the IDEX framework primarily aims at creation of an ecosystem to foster innovation and technology development in defence and aerospace in India by engaging industries including MSMEs, startups, individual innovators, R&D institutes, etc. and this idex framework will be funded and managed by defense innovation organization i know that this defense innovation organization is formed as a not for profit company as per section 8 of the companies act 
2013 for implementing IDEX framework. So statement one is correct. Now coming to the second statement, IDEX is the executive arm of the Defense Innovation Organization. See this statement is also correct. IDEX is also called the executive arm of Defense Innovation Organization. As we already saw, Defense Innovation Organization is the legal entity. It is a Section 8 company created by the Defense Public Sector Undertakings such as HAL and Bell. And this is to support the Ministry of Defense in building the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystem in defense in India by implementing the IDEX framework. So second statement is also correct. IDEX is the executive arm of Defense Innovation Organization. Here the question is asking for correct statements. So the correct answer for the question is option C both 1 and 2. Now let's move on to the final question. Now look at this question here. This question is about Forest Rights Act 2006. Let's take the first statement. As per the act, Gram Shabha can recommend for the clearance of 5 hectare forest land for the construction of schools. See this statement is incorrect. The Gram Shabha can recommend for the clearance of forest land for the construction of schools. But it should be less than 1 hectare. So statement 1 is incorrect. Now coming to the second statement, as per the act, Central government shall provide for diversion of forest land for certain facilities which involve felling of trees not exceeding 75 trees per hectare. See this statement is correct. The central government shall provide for diversion of forest land for certain facilities which involve felling of trees not exceeding 75 trees per hectare. The facilities include schools, dispensary or hospital, anganwadis, fair price shops, electric and telecommunication lines tanks and other minor water bodies, drinking water supply and water pipelines, water or rainwater harvesting structures, minor irrigation channels, non-conventional source of energy, skill up gradation or vocational training centers, roads and community centers. Okay, so these are the facilities for which the central government shall provide for diversion of forest land. And know that the clearance for the construction of these facilities will be recommended by Gram Shabha only if it is less than 1 hectare in each case. Okay, so second statement is correct. Here the question is asking for correct statements. Here second statement alone is correct. So the correct answer is option B 2 only. And this is the quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in the community section. Try to answer it. And the answer for the quiz question is posted in the comment section of the quiz question itself. You can verify it. And displayed here are the main questions for your practice. Go through the questions, write your answers and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you liked our analysis, please like, comment and share. And don't forget to subscribe to Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.